this is Natalie with The Fifth Journey and I'm going to be going over what has been going on the last three years with dealing with IBS, low FODMAP, and an overactive gallbladder and some other things that kind of wrap around in that. So this is going to be a rather long video and I'm going to have all the notes on the blog as well if you want to read through this but I'm going to do this kind of lecture style so I'll be reading it instead of doing a full video off memory because I don't want to forget anything. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'll repeat some things but if you want to treat this more of a podcast or audio only then feel free to do that. You don't have to watch me. There will be times that I'll, I'll bring something up to show but you don't have to actually actually watch that part. So I'll be reading and I'll go ahead and bring that up and get started. So this again is my journey through an overactive gallbladder with bili biliary hyperkinesia, IBS, low FODMAP, and counseling due therapy due to acute phobia, not anxiety, that was kind of all wrapped around in there. So I will get back to that down towards the middle area of this. So go ahead and get started. Um, this has been a three year journey to better health and complete change in lifestyle and relationships with food and gut health as well as mental health. First off, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not affiliated in any way with any person or company I suggest and I'm not making many money off of this. It took me a long time to get to this point and I truly hope to save you some time in your journey so you can hopefully find a solution much quicker than I did. And fair warning, I'll be talking a little bit about bodily functions because here, that's kind of what it's all about. Um, I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible and we'll also have everything written down on the blog. I'll post this whole thing, everything I'm reading, I'll post on there. If you'd refer, re, excuse me, prefer to read through it at a later date or take notes along with the video. I'll be doing this lecture style and we'll be reading it aloud so I don't forget anything important. Keep in mind that I'll leave a lot out since I'm talking about three years here, but it will still be pretty long just not a full novel and you can hear my cat is running a lapse right now so please ignore that. Uh, no judgment as I'm not an eloquent reader even reading my own words I stumble and change things as I go. Feel free to treat this as an audio only and just listen if you prefer. Uh, I will have to jump around a bit if I can save anyone through putting if I can save anyone some time through putting this out there then it's totally worth it to me to put this information out there. And the first part will be dealing with the gallbladder and then later on I'll be talking more about the FODMAP and IBS and all of that. So the most important piece of feedback I give right off the, right off the bat is to reframe your thoughts about food, about gut health, about mental health, about asking for guidance, about opening up to your friends and family as I have found that there is a huge part of our population going through some form of this. Even the random person I talked to at the grocery store about food ingredients was really going through the same thing. It was really, really eye-opening to me how many people are doing this. And if you've come this far, congratulations because you are doing the research. And I'll repeat this numerous times, but when dealing with something like this, there's a lot of misinformation out there or, or lack of information. So you really have to do a lot of research on your own. Looking back, I think I've had some of these issues most of my life but was able to keep it in check based on the diet I was eating. I was eating well, taking my vitamins and probiotics, eating whole foods, fruits and veggies, etc. I've always had a grumbly belly and am often uncomfortable in the evenings and at night. I've always had Alka-Seltzer, Beano and Gas-X in the medicine cabinet to use as needed. My siblings and my parents were the same, so I figured it was normal. Thanksgiving dinner, get out the Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> Broccoli, get out the Gas-X. Even um, since I had been a dancer for more, excuse me, a majority of my life and dance instructor, my adult life, along with working full time elsewhere, I have been a nonstop razor and smoothie protein shake person probably since high school. I need food all the time on the go and can't do big meals before or during classes when I'm teaching. So a lot of small meals and, and that type of thing. Anyway, three years ago in January, the classes I was teaching during the day switched. So I was teaching three dance classes in a row and uh, going through lunch. I was th also 35 at the time. So while I still think I can teach like a 20 year old, I kind of get tired and can't go that long without eating something substantial. So I had to start eating larger meals to hold me over and then I'd be starving after class even though I was still snacking in between those classes. And this is really when things started to change. My first attack, and I call them attacks or episodes, happened a few months later while we were on vacation over spring break. I thought I had food poisoning because that's exactly what it felt like. I was sweating, I was shaking, freezing, but without the throwing up part or the other end. 
I was up all night and I felt absolutely terrible the next day. Like I had been recovering from a 24-hour stomach bug without the other issues. Then I felt fine. I didn't think anything about it until it happened again after the family Easter about a month later. I told Tim that maybe I need to start keeping track of what I was eating because nobody else had any issues and all those food, foods were things I had eaten before. Um, or maybe not eat large meals like that. And then it happened again a few months later, again on vacation. Un uncontrollable shaking, almost like quaking, sweating and feeling like I was going to have an issue like food poisoning and, or the 24-hour bug, but nothing, no actual throwing up or anything like that. I went to the doctor and was told two things. Try a food log with really vague instructions or just simply you're stressed. The stress didn't make sense to me because I was either on vacation or doing something relaxing when those events happened. And when I was super stressed out, like with say tenant turnover with the apartments or, or dealing with other issues, I would be fine. And then it happened again and again and once a month or more, including at home. I started doing research but really couldn't find much other than the apparent blanket term of IBS for any gut issues that don't seem to have a definitive source to the problem. In October 2018, my dad had emergency bypass surgery and I was staying at the hospital with him and I did have a mild case while I was there. It wasn't as awful, but I still had the shaking and everything. Uh, while I wasn't sleeping anyway, due to the circumstances, I started researching again, but this time started with searching for causes of body shaking and quaking instead of dealing with the stomach issues. I found a random article out of the UK that mentioned a gallbladder problem. My mom had hers out a few years back and my dad's appeared to have stones in it when they were doing the preliminary tests before going in for the bypass, which was obviously the pressing issue. That seemed the most logical solution, even though I was not exhibiting the main signs of a malfunctioning gallbladder or non-functioning gallbladder. I made an appointment with another doctor who was a general surgeon who specialized in GI issues and surgeries and such. Note that there are no GI doctors in my area or specialists and that really hadn't dawned on me at the time as this person was recommended by a friend who had gone to him several times because of complications with celiac disease. I explained everything to him, but where I felt the issues, my lower intestines and other factors left him befuddled. He basically said, for lack of a better word, it was a crapshoot and um, at this point and could go either the colonoscopy route, check the gallbladder, or go the other way and check out the upper GI. We decided to go ahead and go the gallbladder route, and by this point, my daily diet hadn't changed, but I was literally living on Beano, Gas-X, Alka-Seltzer, Imodium, and still going three to five times a day. Normally, I was normal for me is about two to three times per day. I had an ultrasound done, which showed nothing wrong with the gallbladder, so then we went on and did the HIDA scan, and that's like a two-hour scan. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on it. You can look that up, but we went ahead and, and went on to that. In the meantime, he had me try a lactate type enzyme for possible lactose intolerance to see if that did anything, which it did not help. Uh, the following appointment, I found out that the ejection fraction for my gallbladder was 84%. I was like, great, that's close to 100%. And they were like, no, that's not great. Uh, normal ejection fraction for the gallbladder is 35 to 65%. Obviously at the time, I didn't know how that worked. That is the rate at which something pumps out, not overall functionality. So that's how fast it's pumping. Um, the doctor said that I had something called biliary hyperkinesia or, a, or an overactive gallbladder. Instead of my gallbladder releasing a small amount of bile as needed, it was basically releasing the entire contents into my intestines when I ate. And then it would fill up and do it all over again and then do it again. So I would store the bile from my liver and then dump the whole thing when I ate instead of releasing just enough to do the job. And the problem of all this is that dealing with overactive gallbladders is something fairly new. Doctors have been taught to look and look for and deal with ones that are functioning below 35 cents, 35 percent. So there's very little data out there. He double checked with another surgeon to discuss the best course of action, and that was to take it out, because it would be better to have a constant, consistent amount of bile in my system than literally a bucketful. Those are my words, not his than um, to really have going on what I was having going on. Since we were heading into the holidays by that point and it wasn't an emergency, we decided to wait until the new year to do the surgery. This would also allow me to recover before I went back to teaching mid-January. And just as a test, he asked me to eat some higher fat meals earlier in the day to see how that went. It basically caused discomfort all day instead of mainly the evenings and then it was a waiting game until surgery. I had surgery the first, first week of January 2019 and I was in and out the same day. 
I took it easy for about two weeks before going back to teaching, though I was still doing regular work on top of that, really through all this thing I was still doing my normal work. It took about six to eight weeks before I could really do any abdominal work and dance like I used to, but I felt great. I felt fantastic. Back to normal and able to eat okay, and since my gallbladder was overactive, I did not experience the ill effects of those who have surgery to remedy a, an underactive or a non-functioning gallbladder. The doctor said that my gallbladder was chronically inflamed, and that was almost two years ago. Okay, now on to the next part of the journey. I'd actually planned to record that part of it um, after <laughs> about six months after I had it done because I was feeling so good, but then, um, yeah, it kind of continued. So that summer, I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable again. I told my husband that I should start looking at what I eat again and kind of thinking about that again. In August, about nine months after my last attack and eight months after surgery, I had another one. Just like before, on vacation, it went quickly downhill from there. I was losing weight. I was afraid to eat. I was afraid to sleep because the attacks were always happening at night. I was getting very little help from any doctors at the point other than saying I was stressed out or it was in my head. Yes, people literally told me that it was all in my head, but I knew it wasn't. Um, I know stress. I know what stress is, and those instances are not what I equate to as a stressful event. Um, any of those days or any time it happened. I would have days with high stress or anxiety and be fine, and then I would have relaxing days and have an episode or attack or whatever you want to call them. Uncontrollable shaking, quaking. I would have this wave come over me, almost like the feeling when you know you're about to pass out, like you have that heat wave and ringing in your ears. I'd have that when I was laying down, but I wouldn't have... I wouldn't pass out and then had shaking and feeling like I had food poisoning. I was going to the bathroom at that time um, during the day, five to eight times per day at this point, and then back to living on the amino, gas X, alka seltzer, and imodium. All this just so I can function enough to work. The final breaking point was mid September 2019, so that was just a little bit over a year ago. My husband and I had planned and saved for a 10-day trip on our 15th, for our 15th wedding anniversary that included an Alaskan cruise with a few days of sightseeing elsewhere before and after. Dream trip, right? I had to go to the doctor earlier that week due to poison ivy and voice my concern about, concerns about being scared of getting sick on the trip. You'll be fine. Just have fun. That's what I was told. The nurse said it. The doctor said it. But just have fun. You'll be fine. The Friday of the trip, I felt good and had the days before. We left at 3 a.m. to head to the airport. It was also a great day because that was the day that the farm was officially ours. When we got to our destination, we had lunch at around 11 a.m. and then we went sightseeing. And then it hit me. 4 p.m. I was in bed, clear until the next day. I emailed my doctor and made an appointment for when I got back. I ended up being sick the entire 10 days. Note, this was not anything contagious but obviously something wrong with my digestive system. I was afraid to eat and being away from home made it worse. My hair was falling out like crazy and I wasn't sleeping. We made the best of it, but by the time we got back home, I had lost an additional five pounds. Seriously, who loses weight on an all-inclusive vacation where you can eat whatever you want? On top of all of this, I was also exhausting all of my distractions to get to sleep. Due to the episodes happening at night, I would often try to distract myself so I could get to sleep and not pay attention to my stomach or the shakes or the closing in feeling, reading, listening to audiobooks, TV, etc. I would fall asleep and then wake up like I had been shocked. And since it was getting colder, I couldn't tell if I was just cold and no big deal or if something else was coming because when I'd have those shakes, I would get really cold and then do the sweating. It was just this endless cycle and I couldn't break it. I had a long visit with my doctor. We, did start, we decided to start with lab work and look at my pancreas because I really wasn't digesting any of the food I was eating. It was just coming out. I know this gross, sorry. <laughs> and I was still trying to eat a healthy diet. Whole grains, fruits, veggies, avocado, lean meats, pre and probiotics, yogurt, etc. The big bad cancer word came up along with hep C. So we did blood work. That came back fine other than having high bilirubin and cholesterol, which honestly I've always had that and it is genetic. My grandma had it, um, a little bit yellow skin and eyes, not jaundice. Um, something called Gilbert syndrome, so that's a totally different thing. We did a CT scan to check for cancer as well as the functionality of my lower GI, liver, and pancreas. Everything thankfully turned out fine. She put me on a pancreatic enzyme to take with food. Mind you, all of this is still a figure it out on your own type of thing, so I had to play with the dose. Um, I started a true food, lo food log with everything I was eating, how I was feeling, bathroom habits, etc. So let me show you that really quick, what I was doing, which my cat is laying on. So this is my first 
food log if you can see it. So it's really kind of cramped, but I have everything on there. The day, um, the highlights is how I was feeling or if I was having some bowel problems, that kind of thing. And then um, how many times I go, what I was eating and all that kind of stuff. This is kind of cramped and it gets better, I promise. Um, that part. So anyway, um, Okay, so lastly, she wanted me to see a counselor to help me find the tools to cope with what I was going through since she did not feel I like needed anxiety medication. And since the scans and lab work came back fine, we decided to look into food allergy testing and a referral to a GI specialist in a nearby city. While the pancreatic enzyme helped, I ended up having few changes in the morning with bathroom habits but felt constipated in the evenings. At that point, I stopped taking all vitamins, probiotics, and any other supplements like fish oil. So I stopped taking the the enzyme as well because it wasn't helping or doing anything. The next part I'll split into two parts even though they went hand in hand and overlap. So I'll be a bit doing some backtracking through here. So I had never been to a counselor or therapist and this was new and unnerving but really what did I have to lose at this point? Uh, honestly it was truly an amazing experience. This part will be indiv individualized so I won't go into a lot of detail. While we dig did dig into a lot of things including childhood and such it was clear that that was not what was causing the problems at hand. She was instrumental in reframing my thoughts to be okay with food and the process and helping me get through the aggravation of not having answers while going through additional testing with the GI specialist. I started gentle yoga, meditation, Headspace was the app that I use, used, and journaling. Um, note, I actually learned that different types of yoga are better or worse for GI problems and discovered that some of the stretches I was doing in dance were actually aggravating it at the time. It's all fine for me now, but there are actually different position stretches that are good for constipation versus diarrhea versus gas and bloating. Just do specific research or chat with a knowledgeable yogi for what you were looking for. And I stopped over researching. I kept going down rabbit holes when I found new information. We all now we all know how it is when we look up symptoms on something like WebMD and discover the worst of everything. It just makes it worse. I won't go into all of that, but now I 100% feel that everyone should go see a counselor every now and then if you can and talk to friends. I opened up to a lot of girlfriends because not only was this going on but challenges of motherhood, work, and other things. Just openly talking is therapeutic and then others opened up and you realize that they are all in the same boat in a lot of ways. The counselor helped me reframe my thoughts when dealing with test results because I was getting more and more frustrated because everything kept coming up negative. I was at the point of desperation because I needed something to be wrong. I needed some answer and not even with the GI specialist. So I, I, I ended up printing off a list of positive affirmations to glance at as needed. Let me show you that really quick. So I just printed this off. I, I always wrote notes when I was in there and I printed off um, a couple pages of just thoughts and notes that I could just glance at as needed. And I kept this in my room and then I also had a, kept a copy in my purse. Just And this really helped. So if I was having something going on, I could just glance at this and it, it really helped reframe everything. Um, finally, I was able to sleep, heavenly sleep. A gentle stretching, a little meditation, and the discovery of visualization and a sound machine. I hadn't used a sound machine. She's like, just try it. And it was really amazing, an amazing thing. Hello, gentle rain sounds. It was great. I started with a week, I started with weekly sessions in October of last year, and then every other week, and then a recap in February. I had planned to go back about once a month or so, but then, as we all know, COVID happened. We have technically not finished with the final test, which would be navigating travel and the new way I'm eating now. I know I haven't gotten to this part yet, but I'll get that get to that soon. Um, I've not felt that I've absolutely needed to go back during any all of this, um, but once in a while, once it is safe to travel to navigate that side of things, and then I will see how that goes and maybe go back and talk with her. The actual diagnosis: acute phobia. That's what I actually was was what she told me. It is not anxiety, it is not something that's treated with medication. While a phobia may never go away, it is an acute thing that can be handled with therapies and self-care. Yes, this child of the 80s, I have to learn about caring for myself. Phobia of eating and phobia of sleeping due to what I ate, I honestly was afraid to put anything in my mouth. It, I mean, even toothpaste, because toothpaste had like sugars and things and I didn't, I didn't even know what was causing it. A friend of mine recommended the book Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nyquist, if I'm saying that right, N-I-E-Q-U-I-S-T. While it is a bit on the religious side for my taste, it's an, amazing, it's an amazing book that helped me reframe my thoughts going through this journey. I actually bought five copies and gave them to friends and family and refer back to highlighted sections in my own copy. Another friend suggested I listen to a podcast he has stumbled upon that talks about 
the mind gut connection from someone who's going through something similar. Actually, this person's case was worse. If you've heard of impact theory, she's one of the ones with that. And um, you can find that particular podcast at paleomg.com. If you search for ex, uh, episode 63, interview with Lisa Bilyeu, if I'm saying that correctly, B-I-L-Y-E-U. Lastly, check out the online archives for Experience Life magazine. They have a lot of great unbiased articles on gut health and the brain-gut connection. While I do far less of those little tick, trick, tips and tricks on a daily basis, I still have to go back to them every now and then when I'm feeling uncomfortable because of something I ate. And if you or someone you know or are caring for is going through something like that, it is absolutely exhausting. Life is crazy anyway, with work and kids and home and, and just everything going on, but then writing literally everything down. Something, everything that goes into your mouth, every bathroom, every time you go to the bathroom, every emotion trying to figure things out, carrying around other lists to see if something is safe at a restaurant or a grocery store, cooking separate meals for yourself and your family, separating food out, trying to get others to understand they can't eat your safe foods because then you'll have nothing to eat in the house. It seems like such a simple thing at first, but it's a huge open tab on the brain computer, which I like to call them open tabs in my brain when there's a lot going on. All right, now on to the next part, um, or back to the second part of this, the food part and how I got to where I am now. While the prior bit was going on, I was also dealing with the body and food side of things. With the GI specialist, I was tested for SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and that's something you wanna get checked out first to make sure there's nothing that does need medication. Um, I was checked for lactose and I was checked for celiac disease. So you really want to make sure that you get those checked out first before going any into any type of, of dietary changes. All those came up negative. I was still keeping the food bathroom logs, but nobody is really looking for those and I can't make heads or tails of the patterns. So, and I showed you those, those earlier. And again, frustrated that I was not getting anywhere. But he did diagnose me with IBS-M, which is the M stands for a mix. There's also IBS-C, which is constipation, IBS-D, which is um, more the diarrhea, which really I kind of go more on that side. Um, so unfortunately, I did end up get with that blanket statement label. IBS-M is actually harder to treat because it is a mix of symptoms. And of course, knowing me, I have that one. At the same time, my primary doctor suggested I have allergy testing and the controversial subject of food sensitivity tests came up. And I ended up having that test done because I didn't really have an allergy. And again, that's something different. Um, it was obviously a, a sensitivity. So I had that test done and that included having, um, being able to work with a registered dietitian. Holy cow, game changer. While the food sensitivity test did not give a lot of useful information in the long run, it did put me in touch with probably the most important person in this journey so far. If you haven't done so yet and you're this far along, find a registered dietitian not a nutritionist, but somebody who's actually trained and preferably Monash, a Monash trained one, but we'll get to that. At this point, I'm also on a time crunch because it's nearing the end of the year. If you remember, I had surgery that January. So that plus countless doctor visits, scans, lab tests, appointments, I had met my deductible, ouch, expensive year. And I didn't want to start over in the new year. And as we all know, that's 2020 and yes, yeah, a gray year, right? So going on. Everything with the dietitian was done remotely, so I would talk to her on the phone and send her scans of all of my food bathroom logs. Based on that information, she asked if I had ever heard of the FODMAP diet. That's F-O-D-M-A-P diet. Nope, another game changer. And a tough one to start, but absolutely worth it. As a crash course, low FODMAP is an actual medical diet, not a fad diet. It's not used for losing weight, gaining weight. It's an actual medical diet. Monash University is in Australia, does all of the testing and research. There are actual foods certified that are Monash certified, and there's actually another one that certifies food as well. I'll get back to that later. A huge aha moment. The dietitian told me that I need to look at the previous meal that was causing issues, not the meal I was on. So usually when we have an upset stomach, we go, oh, I just ate something bad. Actually, when you eat something, it signals your stomach to empty into the intestines and then on out. So it's actually the meal or two before that is the problem once it's in the intestines. That was a game changer that nobody had ever told me about. And I'm talking about intolerances here, not allergies. That is something completely different and generally that um, an allergy is an, is an immediate problem. On my final appointment with my GI specialist, I brought up the FODMAP diet and I was told that it helps with some people, not all, and got the overall good luck with that feeling. 
It was apparent that this particular individual was focused on treating diseases and symptoms, but not underlying issues. I'm not saying all that are like this, um, but this was something, um, but there's nothing showing up in the tests and he couldn't write me a prescription. So that was kind of the end of that. In hindsight, I wish I'd gone to a different GI specialist, but it doesn't really matter now because there are some and many out there that will look at the whole picture. That being said, it is imperative that you still get tested for certain things like CBO and celiac and others before doing any changes to your diet. Diseases, allergies, and intolerances are very different things and should be handled in different ways. The hardest part is finding out the right path. So the week before Thanksgiving last year, which actually <laughs> next week is Thanksgiving, so really um, a, year, a year later, I was told I needed to go on an elimination diet. I'm not joking. I cried when she sent me the list of the foods that I couldn't eat because that was literally everything I was eating. And I cried again when I went to the store to try to shop. There was nothing I could eat, and, but I was determined to get better. While timing was terrible during the holidays, I didn't want to wait two more months and continue to go through what I was going through. The counselor who I was going to at the time was very helpful in navigating this part. I love to cook too, so I could find out so I had to find out what I could eat. Things started to get better, but they still weren't back to normal yet. I started do, doing more research on low FODMAP, and another friend sent me a resource from Monash University. At that point, I hadn't heard of that yet. I changed my food logs to share with the dietitian. Let me show you those how I, I changed those. So I made it a little bit easier, easier to read, <laughs> much bigger, but I have basically everything I ate through the day. Um, all these notes on the bottom are things how I felt at bedtime. I have um, going to the bathroom in the morning, anything, any notes that happen, anything I try, any headaches, um, any other issues. And this was, um, let's see, I started the original in October and this log goes clear until June. So I had continued on clear through all of the, the elimination, the introduction and the personalization phases, which again, I would get to. So um, I continued to press forward, but still not a lot of changes. While I wasn't going eight times a day anymore, hallelujah, I was still going around the three to five mark and every day was different. I was having bumps in the road like eating dried food and having a heck of a time um, only to be told by a dietitian, dietitian I shouldn't have that. So dried foods actually have much higher FODMAP content. Well, that wasn't on the list. So far, this whole process had been like a puzzle, but you don't know what the picture looks like. And then you figure out what the picture looks like and then you discover that you were missing pieces. And then the final missing pieces and onto the end of my journey and where I am now. By then, it was around Christmas of last year, 2019, and I was at my all time low weight, 114 pounds, and I'm pretty tall. The last time I saw that on a scale, I was probably 13 years old. I was terribly thin. I know I'm not a large person anyway, but it was pretty darn scary. When I was researching low FODMAP, I discovered a few groups on Facebook that were absolutely amazing, plus a few that, well, weren't. I would honestly stay away from the blanket IBS support groups because those were very overwhelming and almost panic inducing because it would kind of take you back to that WebMD mentality and thinking that something else was wrong. So I would read about somebody else's story and be like, oh my gosh, maybe that's what I need to look into. So I, I stayed away from those pages. Um, anyway, I discovered low FODMAP recipes and support and a sister page, USA low FODMAP products. So depending on where you are, there are other groups. So we have the USA low FODMAP products, look for your area. This was absolutely eye-opening. It is run by FODMAP trained individuals and I downloaded the Monash app so I could see the true diet as well as the current updates. Come to find out that a lot of resources, including what my dietitian had, were out of date. The app was only around $10, so absolutely worth it. And one time, $10, any devices. So I have it on my tablet, I have it on my phone, I still use it. And yeah, a year later, I'm still looking things up and checking things out. So um, back to low FODMAP and IBS and what is it? So crash course, FODMAPs are carbohydrates in food. Each letter stands for a different type that consists of a wide variety of FODMAP containing foods. Some people may be sensitive to one or two categories and some may be sensitive to all. These FODMAPs are excellent for gut bacteria. They're actually not absorbed by anyone. However, the lucky ones of us with IBS have rather yucky side effects from, from them, such as gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, or combination. And uh, with normal people, with, with, with normal functioning guts, it just, it feeds the bacteria, does what it's supposed to, and then it goes on out with the system and, and no issues there. Um, 
They do not do permanent damage, like with someone with celiac disease, but it makes us downright miserable and sometimes not able to leave the bathroom. Wheat, for example, is high FODMAP, so a lot of gluten-free foods are suggested. Gluten is a protein, so that is fine, unless you have celiac, of course, but the fructans, which is the FODMAP, of, are the carbohydrates in wheat to cause the issue. This is why the initial testing is so important to rule out something like the celiac disease. It's also why proper elimination and reintroduction is so important. Time consuming and frustrating, absolutely, but also absolutely worth it. With the exception of garlic and onion, all of the FODMAP containing foods have safe limits, and all of these can be found in the app. And because we have and because we must have food for the good bacteria in our systems, it is imperative that you still consume all of these foods in small doses. Otherwise, you will have a worse mess if the good bacteria in your system isn't fed. Back to the initial testing, SIBO is a big one. So small, bacteria, small intestine bacteria overgrowth, basically there's, there's kind of a flap that, that blocks off the small intestine. So a SIBO is when that bacteria leaks up into where it's not supposed to, and that can cause issues too. Um, because that needs to be taken care of first before doing any diet changes because you have to, do, have to have some type of antibiotic for that. Again, not a doctor, but I'm just throwing that out there so you know. But you can do research on that. Now, back to me not knowing what I could eat. I went through the Monash app and made an Excel spreadsheet of everything I could eat and in safe amounts. So really quick, I'm gonna show you on my phone the Monash app. So it has this little, you can see this little squiggly thing and that's that's the what you'll see on boxes like Kellogg's. A lot of the cereals have that. There's different things that have that, app, uh, excuse me, that little symbol and that means it's Monash certified. So it has a food guide, it has the actual, you can click start the, the diet, it has everything spelled out for you. But if I click on the food guide, like I said, I still use this. So there has fruit, vegetables, everything is broken up. There's a search bar and you can type in whatever food that you want in this. They have stuff, again, it's based in Australia, but they have foods worldwide in there that you can do a search and then find up. And there's also categories. So if you, you are fine with something, then you can turn off different, different categories so you can continue eating okay. So I made a list of, I went through everything that I eat and time consuming, yes, but you know, it really actually saved um, a lot of time in the long run. So I made a list of all the safe foods that I could eat and things I'd eat on a regular basis. And then I highlighted things depending on what category they were in. So if I was making dinner, I could just glance at this. If I needed to modify recipes, it made it a lot easier to do that. And that way with like the food, the, excuse me, the color coordination, um, I can say, okay, this has, like this recipe has three greens in it. Okay, I have to knock one of those out because I don't want to have too many of the same FODMAP category. So like I said, each one stands for a different category. Um, so anyway, that was something that I did that was really, really helpful. So I kept a copy of that in my kitchen. I also put it on my phone. So if I was gone or if I had to go grocery shopping or went to a restaurant, um, that type of thing really helped. Um, so this really made shopping and meal planning easier. I also made a list of easy breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals, plus snacks so I could glance at it and go on with my day instead of stewing about what I could or couldn't have. So this was something, and you know, mine may be different than something you put together, but this is just something I put on the fridge. So I just threw out breakfast things and snacks and drinks and uh, like leftovers. You know, if I made a big meal, um, different things like that, desserts as well because there's you know a lot of options you can do for desserts. So that just that made life a lot easier going through that process. So the two Facebook groups I talked about earlier were very instrumental in going through all of this. You can find almost every recipe in there or ask for help converting one. There's many times and even recently like with the holidays I'll throw a recipe on there and say okay what would you do um, to convert this so it would be FODMAP safe or FODMAP friendly or um, like what is a safe serving like if, if these, if these um, changes are made how much of this can I eat and people are really good to help you out with figuring out how much you can eat and all of that with that. So um, everything in the salad dressings and cream soups there are recipes that people have tried and done and work. Um, there's recipes and websites that are on those pages that um, have tasty options for you or the whole family to enjoy. And there's other people in those groups that are in the same boat, boat with great ideas of what to try. With the products page, that was the USA Low FODMAP products, you literally type in what you're looking for, like say Aldi. We have an Aldi, I love Aldi. They have a, a gluten-free wrap. If it's safe, it will pop up. If it isn't, you just post a picture with the ingredients and an admin will let you know um, 
let you know if it is or isn't. Soon you'll have a safe list of foods and grocery shopping and cooking will be much easier. Yes, the beginning sucks, it does, um, but it gets better and it's worth it. Anybody who's been on this say, it sucks, but it gets better and it's worth it. Um, I just actually found out this last couple days they are working on a new site, uh, Fig or foodisgood.com is up and coming. Actually, you can go to the website and sign up for their, um, to be notified when it's up. But it's supposed to be a searchable database for a variety of dietary restrictions, including FODMAP and others. So that one, I guess, would replace that, like the, the, the products page. So you just put in your product and it'll pop up and you can do different dietary restrictions. So say if you have FODMAP and you also have celiac, or you have FODMAP and you also have, um, you can't have dairy or corn or things like that, um, then you'd put that in there. So that's up and coming, which is really exciting. The next and final big find was the actual, was an actual Monash trained dietitian. Uh, Monash, I didn't say this earlier, is M-O-N-A-S-H. While, uh, while the one I had initially found got me going in the right direction, she wasn't fully trained in this area and was missing some information. I found Everyday Nutrition based out of Australia they do virtual meetings, but I decided to go the group route and sign up for their, they call it the FODMAP Collective. Again, I'm not getting paid for any of this. It just was an excellent resource, and I will literally tell everybody and anybody to use any of these because it was so helpful to me. Uh, this is a private group of people going through the challenges together. So instead of doing it on your own, um, they do everything together. So they have all the materials available for each challenge and they offer support and suggestions and have live meetings every two weeks. So say you're challenging, like this week we're challenging garlic and onion or garlic or whatever, because they break things up and they have recipes they give you, they have how to do it daily thing. You, you say, okay, I'm doing this. I've had this issue. And they say, they kind of help you navigate everything through and it helps having other people going through it with you. Um, I'll not go into a lot of detail on the FODMAP diet itself other than really what I've done because that would truly be another novel and it is very individualized. So what works for me may not be the same as somebody else. Um, and really that's what these amazing dietitians are for and that's why I'm recommending. For me, it was the, the, the rate, exchange rate, it came to be about 10 bucks a month. That was it, $10 a month. So with the Monash app, that was $10, that's it. And then with them, I was spending 10 bucks a month and I stayed on with them for about six months and really well worth it and a fraction of the cost of what I had already done. So you're looking at having surgery, which I would have had to have surgery anyway, but having all those appointments and all the appointments of not knowing where to, where to go, what to do, um, it was a fraction of the cost of what I had already done. So really, really well worth it. So what, six months at 10 bucks a month and then the app, $70, that's <laughs> cheaper than one appointment. Um, anyway, I ended up giving up coffee in 2020 and while that isn't a, in January 2020, and while that isn't a FODMAP issue, it can still be an irritant, especially since I was more on the D side of things versus the C side. Um, please note, I do still eat a lot of chocolate and that's a-okay. And guess what? I was symptom free. So going back to the bathroom about one to three times a day and feeling really good, it was time to start phase two, which was reintroduction. So you have the elimination first. So I did that. Um, I started it really around Thanksgiving and then um, end of December, 1st of January was my, when I joined Everyday Nutrition. So I kind of had to continue on elimination for a little bit longer um, because I had to redo some things because all the information I had before wasn't exact. Um, the reintroduction part is when you start to systematically test the food categories in each food. This part does take some time, so patience is key. This whole process is not meant to stay FODMAP free, but to find out tolerance levels as well as foods or what foods or categories you need to avoid. So everyone is different. After elimination is reintroduction. After reintroduction is personalization. And that, if you look at the app, it actually has it on there so you can kind of go through. And it actually has the testing on there if you want to do it there too. It tells you day one of testing whatever testing cashews. You're going to have so many cashews and so many on day two, so many on day three. Now note really quick, the measurements in Australia where this is based on a tablespoon for instance is not the same size as it is in the U.S. So grab a scale because their measurements are a little bit different so I ended up weighing everything out. Definitely do that. Um, my journal, my journey, excuse me, took a lot longer than most because Remember how I kept getting all those negatives on all the tests? Well, it continued. I kept passing challenge after challenge. 
Generally, you're supposed to only test one food in each category because you're testing the FODMAP in the food, not the food itself. So I ended up testing every single challenge food in every single category, and I passed every single one. I might get a little bit gassy, but nothing compared to what I was dealing with before. Before going on to the personalization phase, I had a discussion with the dietitians with Everyday, Everyday Nutrition. They sent me two more challenges for food chemicals, salicylates, and I don't know how to say this, amines, A-M-I-N-E-S, but they're food chemicals, um, kind of like histamines and things like that, because some people can have issues with those. Guess what? I passed those as well. Now, I'm a bit OCD when it comes to these things, so if you watch any of my videos like with soap making and all that kind of stuff, I research like crazy before I, I do anything or as I'm doing things. Um, but I wanted to make sure I was doing everything right. I used a scale to measure out my foods and I even counted chips. When I had talked to that original dietitian, when she said we need to do elimination, she was amazed that I was doing so well because she said people that do this, they usually have to restart two or three times. Because she's, she said we need to make sure you have one serving of say chips and I would, I would count out the chips and she's like, wow. I'm like, well, I wanna do this right. Um, anyway. So there definitely wasn't any cheating going on while I was going through this, but I was continuing to feel good with no major upsets. Every now and then I would feel uncomfortable, but peppermint tea and ginger chews are now my saving grace. And then I started to transition into phase three, which is personalization. And now comes the aha moment and the discomfort. So this was, um, let's see, June, July-ish when I started doing that of this year. This is where you add things back in on a more regular basis and in larger quantities. Now, when you challenge foods, you stay on the elimination style while you're doing that. So you, you're on elimination, low FODMAP diet, and only focus on one food at a time. So even on the last day of the challenge, with one particular food, you have a large dose, but once everything, but, but everything else is low to act as a control because you're essentially running a personal experiment. And personalization phase is another experiment. It is now November 2020, and with all the craziness going on, I feel pretty darn good. What are the results for me? Well, fructans are my biggest issue. There's a whole pile of food. It's probably the largest category out of all of them. Um, I should say probably is the largest category out of all, the, all of them. That um, includes wheat, beans, soy, squash, teas, inulin, chicory, and many more, a lot of additives. Um, can I have wheat? Yes, but I can only have it once a day. And better yet, true sourdough, not fake sourdough, but true sourdough has a higher safe serve because the fermentation has already been done before, so it's gentler on your intestines. So that fermentation, like wheat, is not happening in my stomach. Can I have beans? Yes, but black beans are better than other types. And like I said, when you look at the app, it'll have black beans, it'll have pinto beans, kidney beans, um, lots of different beans, and they all have different levels and safe servings on those. So I, like if I'm having Mexican food, uh, instead of having pinto beans or kidney beans like I used to, I just use black beans, um, chilies, things like that. I use that as well. Um, squash can give me trouble if I have too much. So like yellow squash, the crick neck type, type um, in my area, that gives me trouble, but zucchini seems to be okay. Soy itself is okay, but not textured soy vegetable protein. It's funny it's called a protein because it's actually a carbohydrate. And that's a, no, I can't have that at all. And that is something that's added to, I think it's really to add texture or to bulk to some, like, some products, um, some meat products, so that is not good. Um, Non-FODMAP issues I have discovered is that raw veggies um, really bother me, so I cook everything. Um, pickled foods like jalapenos and salsa do not bother me, but raw ones do. And I didn't say this earlier, but artificial sweeteners like Splenda and sucralose and fibers, I avoid like the plague. Terrible time to say that word, but I do. Um, I've always known those are bad, probably since high school, so I, I really bother this. That kind of goes back to the toothpaste thing, because there are sugars. They added toothpaste, so I thought, well, maybe that was it. Um, fiber is actually a FODMAP issue depending on which way you swing. So whether you're C, constipation, or D, diarrhea will determine which one's best for you, but I never take fiber. Not, mm -mm, it's bad for me. Um, I no longer take any vitamins, supplements, or probiotics. And if you think about probiotics and prebiotics, they feed the gut bacteria, so those are actually high FODMAP. So if you're having a FODMAP issues, then that may be making a lot worse. So I also haven't taken Beano, or Imodium, or Gas-X, or Alk seltzer in almost a year and I just make sure I have peppermint tea, peppermint pills, and shoes on hand all the time. And that is my go-to, and it's a really amazing thing. 
Remember that low FODMAP is an actual medical diet and should be treated as such. Talk to your doctor, do the research, do the right research, and don't be too hard on yourself. And guess what? Since it's a medical diet, there are safe foods with certifications. Look for FODMAP friendly, which is green, and the Monash labels, the Monash one was the one I showed you earlier, is blue. Disney resorts, they will cook specifically for this diet. Uh, while cruises obviously aren't happening right now, they will modify a menu if you call ahead, which we had done because we were supposed to go on a cruise this summer. So last spring, before everything shut down, we had called and they said, yeah, yeah, we just call ahead and we can modify the menu for you and we can you know, make it as comfortable as possible for you. Has this year been stressful? Yes, it has been horribly stressful for all of us, but I now know the foods that I ate were the problem, not the stress. When I look back at the trip I took with my husband, it's obvious that it was the way I was eating. And though I thought I was doing the right thing, it was actually making it worse. I was eating a lot of wheat, fruits, veggies, pasta, nutrition bars, probiotics, teas, and others. And they were almost, everything was high FODMAP. I was, my whole diet was high FODMAP. And that had been my diet for most of my life. Overall healthy, yes, but not right for my body. And it was making me sick. And even back in my 20s, I was still gassy and comfortable, but, and that was probably why. I finished all of my testing this past summer and so thankful I've gotten to this point. I still do have a separate food area in my kitchen that's exclusively mine. I've adapted the most majority of our recipes so I can cook one meal or a little section that's mine. If I do, say, Mexican food, I'll make a safe base for me, take out my portion, and then add any extra ingredients, so like salsas. Um, so I make my own salsa and then the family, they can just have regular store-bought salsa and that's fine. If I make a breaded dish, I'll do a sourdough or a cornbread or cornflake breading on my portion. If I do, or like something with a stuffing on top. If I do pie, I'll either do gluten-free or sourdough crust, or I'll make sure that that is my only portion of wheat for that day. If I want to make cookies, cake, or a bread like zucchini bread, I'll use gluten-free flour, excuse me, or I'll do a sourdough type recipe with a long fermentation time. At some point, hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to finish the final phase, which is the navigating travel. But I am so thankful to have the tools for when that time does come. I still use the Monash app. I still use the Facebook groups. Even with where I am now, it is a lifelong journey, and this is really how it's going to be. Food companies are creating sensitive recipes, safe spices, and providing more detailed information. You can call places like Aldi, which I've done several times, to check ingredients for your region. Some foods are safe in one part of the country, but may have different ingredients in your area. So back to, say, the, okay, the gluten-free spinach wraps. So on that low FODMAP page, somebody had posted them and said, oh, those aren't safe, but then I posted them and they had different ingredients. So we called and depending on where the food is processed or made in your region, it might have slightly different ingredients, which really stinks. Um, and I talked to the person, it was actually interesting because that individual did have IBS as well. So he's like, I totally understand. So I'm like, can you please pass it on? But I also just found out that they have a um, sensitive pasta recipe, uh, pasta sauce. So I'm hoping to get a hold of that this week to try it. Um, anyway, so I know where to look and who to ask for help. I've also found stretches to do as needed in the best positions to fall asleep, as well as avoiding a lot of clothing that is too tight around the waistband. So just simple things like that, you know, changing the way you sleep can, or the positions and all that, or you know, avoiding certain clothes can really help how you feel later on in the day. Is this something that will go away for me? No, it won't. It's like the acute phobia, things will get better, but it will not ever go away. I just have the tools. So I just have to remember to breathe. Tomorrow may be uncomfortable, but it's not going to cause permanent damage. And it's, it'll be okay in a day or so. And, and, a, and a year later, I still get a tad nervous at night, especially if I'm a little uncomfortable or I'm cold, because I always have that, that, that might come back. But you know what, it, it always turns out okay. I fall asleep and all is well. So I hope that you have found this helpful in your own journey. Each of us is going to have a different experience and different results, but I hope that some part of this, you will save you some time finding your own solution. Is it daunting? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. I wish you the absolute best in your own journey to better health for you. Remember, this is a whole puzzle, not individual pieces.